I've been saying good morning, but I'm not quite sure whether that's appropriate because I know that our speaker is joining us very late in the evening or very early in the morning, whichever way you look at 2.30 in California at the moment. Um, but you'll see why we've been so keen to have him as I introduce him. Um, we're very privileged to have uh, Professor Robert Proctor, um, Professor of History and by courtesy of Medicine at Stanford University, joining us for this portion of our proceedings. Uh, you'll see why he has the unusual distinction of being a historian who's also um, uh, a professor of medicine when I tell you a little bit about the work that he's, he's done. He did a BS at Indiana University, um, was educated at Harvard University, uh, and then taught at Penn State University before joining Stanford. Um, his work centered first on Nazi science. Um, and a very important book, uh, Racial Hygiene, Medicine Under the Nazis, uh, was published in 1988. He followed that up with a more thematically oriented volume on value-free science, purity and power in modern knowledge. And we will have seen those themes emerging now and again in people's discussions of Fisher also. Um, after that came two very important books on the cancer wars, how politics shapes what we know and don't know about cancer, um, which inspired television documentary engagement. Um, and then on the Nazi war on cancer, um, which won the Wieselta Award and has been translated into Italian, Turkish, Polish, Japanese, German, and French. Um, more recently, he's helped pioneer a new um, conceptual study, uh, agnotology, investigating the making and unmaking of ignorance um, with an important uh, edited volume. Um, and his major book, Golden Holocaust, Origins of the Cigarette Cat Catastrophe and the Case for Abolition, um, published in 2011-2012, um, won the Rachel Carson Prize of the Society for the Social Studies of Science. So you will have seen the pertinence and urgency of the issues that Robert Proctor takes up. What my sketch hasn't done is given an understanding of the extraordinary scope of his intellectual interests and the empirical richness of his work. I'm very pleased to present to you Professor Robert Proctor. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me coming from uh, California here. I'm going to read my lecture and it should be around uh, 40 minutes and I, I welcome your questions. In 1957, Sir Ronald Fisher ridiculed the idea of cigarettes causing cancer as a delusion that would one day become recognized as a catastrophic and conspicuous howler. Fisher accused scholars of confusing cause and effect, people with cancer. He proposed ease the pain in their lungs by smoking, creating the semblance of a causal relation when the reality was quite the opposite. People smoked to relieve the itch created by cancer, and only smoking could scratch that itch. So we wrongly think that smoking causes cancer when the reality, Fisher says, is that cancer causes smoking. This was the so-called itch in the lung hypothesis, also known as the Fisher hypothesis, an idea so beloved by cigarette makers that we find it referenced some 400 times in the industry's secret archives. How should we think about such a colossal error? How did such a distinguished scholar get it so wrong? And what kind of influence did Fisher and like-minded colleagues have on the broader denial campaign. Crucial to understand in this context is that Fisher is raising his doubts at a time when the causal link between cigarettes and cancer was already well established as a result of four distinct and converging lines of evidence, epidemiology, both retrospective and prospective, Chemistry, by which I mean the identification of known cancer-causing chemicals in smoke, notably benzpyrene, but also arsenic, lead, and uh, beta-naphthalamine, and a number of others. 
A third tradition that we call animal experimentation, which showed that smoke could cause cancer when condensed onto the skins of mice, rabbits, and a number of other animals. And finally, clinical pathology in both comparative and experimental forms. Smokers who had died from, say, a motorcycle accident were shown to have precancerous lesions in their lungs, for example. And clinical pathologists had shown experimentally that smoke causes stasis in the trachea of cows, cats, and several other animals, allowing the poisons of smoke to concentrate, especially in, in, the, in pulmonary bifurcations. Cigarette makers had already acknowledged the significance of each of these lines of evidence. In the infamous Claude Teague memo from 1953 at R.J. Reynolds, maker of camel cigarettes, but they'd kept that knowledge to themselves while publicly disputing the truth. Publicly, they claimed that mice are not men, and that, if even, and that even if condensed smoke causes cancer, that tells us nothing about what they called whole fresh smoke. They claimed that you could prove anything with statistics, and that even if smoking did cause physical harm, it also had mental benefits, relieving the stress that itself could cause illness. That's why they funded Hans Selye, the father of stress, author of the theory that stress rather than smoking was the most important cause of heart attacks, for which he received over $600,000 as, as a special projects operative. The denial can campaign by the tobacco industry helped cause smoking rates to rebound following a dramatic fall in 1953 and 1954 when the evidence was first widely publicized. So whereas cigarette consumption in the United States plunged by 40 billion cigarettes per year between 1952 and 1954, by 1955 sales had fully recovered and would go on to climb for the next 25 years, peaking in 1981 at 630 billion sticks per year. Today, we still have about 7 trillion cigarettes smoked annually worldwide. That's 7, 7 million million. Stretched end to end, that's about 600 million kilometers of cigarettes, enough to make a continuous chain from the earth to the sun and back with enough left over for several, for a couple of round trips to Mars, admittedly when Mars is in a near-Earth orbit. Cigarettes are smoked faster than the rate at which satellites orbit the Earth, roughly 15 kilometers per second. That's how fast globally cigarettes are smoked, which of course is why cigarettes remain the leading preventable cause of death, even in our time of COVID. Globally, cigarettes killed only about 100 million people in the 20th century, and we are still on pace for several hundred million more in the present century. In the United States alone, cigarettes killed about 30 million people in the 20th century, more than have died from all the wars fought by this country, and you would have the same uh, in uh, the rest of the world as well. And this is, uh, this is just some other uh, different peaks, whether you look total per capita, adult per capita, and peak death, and so forth. Now, the three main causes, and by the way, this is just the relative scale here we're talking about uh, in terms of number of cigarette deaths compared with all wars. This is just uh, data for the United States. Now, the three main causes of the epidemic are mass production, mass marketing, and mass deception. Mass deception includes the manufacture of doubt, which is sometimes actually quantified by the tobacco industry, whence agnometrics. But they also, but also design reassurances like toasting, menthols, filters, lights, low tars, ultralights, and more recently, cigarettes advertised as natural, organic, or additive free, all of which are frauds built into the design nomenclature of the cigarette itself. Now, mass production has to do with the development of continuous process methods that essentially make an infinite rope of cigarettes, which is why they can be produced at a very, very high rate. Uh, this is very different. This is a typical, uh, the, the Protos M8, uh, M5 uh, cigarette maker of Hauni, the Hamburger Universelle, 
Corporation in Hamburg. This is very different from the 1880s world where cigarettes were rolled by hand, mostly by women and girls in small shops. Ads, of course, uh, included a lot of symbolism. This is the uh, mass marketing that I'm uh, mentioning here, uh, which you can explore in detail on our website called SRITA at Stanford, which includes uh, 50,000 high resolution images of tobacco uh, ads uh, throughout the world. This is just a couple of sample. There's a lot of complex iconography in this, you know, light up a camel while you're waiting for a bus. Uh, this figure here to sell uh, silk cut cigarettes. I won't even try to explain. Uh, I'm not sure which brand is being advertised here that deserves further research, uh, but we have Harvard cigarettes, we have Princeton cigarettes, we have Stanford cigarettes, uh, even Cambridge cigarettes. And the scope of here is, is big. Everything is about proportion, of course, and $250 billion has been spent just in the United States for over the last 50 years or so uh, to uh, market cigarettes. Okay, now I'm not going to dwell on marketing or production, which are, which are themselves fascinating, but I will say that a big chunk of the recovery that in the sale of cigarettes that takes place in the 1950s, allowing cigarette consumption to climb to new heights, was the tobacco industry's weaponization of an army of compliance scholars, including men like Sir Ronald uh, Fisher. Statisticians would prove especially useful to the industry especially insofar as they could be used in a kind of evidentiary bar raising, allowing the industry to claim that whatever evidence was being marshaled to indict cigarettes was not using the latest, fanciest methods to prove the point. And there's a long history of such bar raising from Fisher himself to Alvin Feinstein to Don Rubin and, and dozens of others, and I name all uh, the names in my, in my Golden Holocaust. Here should we recall that among all the scholarly disciplines, history, my own field, and statistics are two of the most profoundly corrupted by big tobacco. My own field of history, perhaps even more than statistics. About 100 professional historians just in the United States have worked for the cigarette industry, mainly to produce their so-called common knowledge or public awareness defense in litigation. I've written extensively on this in, in, in Golden Holocaust and elsewhere. But here, let me simply point out that cigarette makers have shoveled hundreds of millions of dollars to compliance scholars in exchange for cigarette-friendly research, cigarette-friendly testimony, both in court or in regulatory hearings, and cigarette-friendly popular writings. It would be difficult to make a list of all the scholars who found themselves enmeshed in this enterprise. We would be talking about many thousands, funded typically with the goal of finding ways to undermine the evidence that cigarettes cause cancer or some other aspect of preserving the social acceptability of smoking. One well, gauge of this is the fact that at least 25 Nobel laureates have taken money from the cigarette industry with different levels of complicity. And this is a, a list here, it goes on to, on to two pages. This, it's uh, quite, quite a number of distinguished scholars, all of whom have uh, uh, taken money from big tobacco. Now, I'm not going to say uh, too much about why Fisher himself was so naive, but I do want to talk about how his eugenics and broader constitutional hypothesis was used by the industry, the tobacco industry, to prolong the epidemic, since that's what we are really talking about. The damage is in the delay. The fall in consumption we see from 1981 could have and should have occurred much earlier, but for the multi-billion dollar denial campaign launched <clears throat> at the Plaza Hotel in 1953. Now it's important to consider this, 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 this embryo, this, this December 14th, 1953 meeting uh, at the Plaza Hotel. This is where the plot was hatched to create the semblance of an industry acting responsibly to get at the truth by supporting research. The genius of this enterprise is that the industry managed to position itself as a defender of science. The denial campaign is couched in the language of science and of prudence. 
instead, indeed, of, of scientific neutrality and objectivity. Science is de deployed in defense of a consider both sides of a purported controversy, which can only be resolved by keeping an open mind. And above all else, we need more research, or as Imperial Tobacco once put it, ideally research must go on and on and on. That becomes the mantra of the industry's denial campaign, the conspiracy that lasts formally from 1953 through 1998, and in certain key respects, even into the present. This should sound familiar from other doubt mongering campaigns to exonerate asbestos, lead, sugar, climate change, and myriad other human hazards, which often involve some of the same actors and many of the same techniques. And I, I wrote about this originally in my Cancer Wars, where I, I actually coined uh, the term uh, uh, agnotology along with uh, the uh, uh, linguist Ian Boll. I should also say that, that I don't use the term conspiracy lightly. We're talking about, an, uh, we're talking here about adjudicated racketeers. And if this is not a conspiracy, then we should probably remove that word from our dictionaries. As to timing, the concealment campaign is still ongoing in certain respects. And I don't know of, any, of a cigarette maker anywhere in the world who's admitted that millions have died from cigarettes, that filters don't make cigarettes any safer, that lights or low tars are no safer, that most people who smoke are addicted, that nicotine is as addictive as heroin or cocaine, that almost half of the cigarettes as presently made are defective in the legal sense, and a dozen, dozen other crucial facts. So tobacco denialism in this sense is not anti-science, but rather a kind of ortho or uber science, the science of skew, of misdirection. Good science in the small, in the ser albeit in the service of a broader deception. The industry dons the mantle of science and ends up representing itself as a defender of science, a funder of science, which is how Sir Ronald came to their attention. Cigarette makers loved Ronald Fisher. They especially liked what they called the Fisher hypothesis, a term that appears in hundreds of documents in the tobacco industry's online archive which houses now some 90 million pages of formerly secret documents, mostly disgorged as part of settlements reached in litigation in the 1990s, uh, some of which even earlier in the 1980s were sequestered into the, through the pants of uh, Merrill Williams, a, a paralegal who smuggled out the nucleus of what later becomes this uh, historical treasure. Cigarette makers amplified Fisher's questioning of the evidence, which appeared in newspapers and magazines all over the United States, invariably with attribution to, quote, the father of modern statistics, the world's leading statistician, the distinguished goateed gentleman, and so forth. On December 20th, 27th, 1957, for example, Fisher delivered a lecture at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Indianapolis, characterizing stop smoking efforts as what he called terrorist propaganda. This was widely reported in the popular press. It was even featured prominently in the 1957 annual report of Liggett and Myers, makers of Chesterfield cigarettes. All of this cigarette-friendly press was ginned up by Hill and Knowlton, the world's largest public relations firm, tasked with amplifying the industry's denial, me denialist message uh, Hill and Knowlton being uh, one of about 20 principal instruments of the conspiracy with offices occupying an entire floor of the Empire State Building right above the uh, newly formed offices of the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, the chief distraction research engine. Now, Joan Fisher Box, in her biography, mentions that her father in 1958 was hired to help American cigarette makers defend themselves in litigation. She also notes that in 1960, he was brought over to the United States to help the industry prepare for litigation. She rightly points out that such suits were unsuccessful, but that is an understatement. Cigarette makers were able to defeat the first 200 odd lawsuits filed against them, mainly by marshaling an army of cigarette friendly experts, all of whom testified there was no proof that cigarettes actually caused disease. It's hard to overestimate the power of the industry during this time. 
In Britain in the 1950s, for example, 20% of all government revenues came from taxes on tobacco. I want to emphasize that 20% of all government revenues in the 1950s in Britain came from taxes on tobacco. The industry's power was such that they even got a British judge to suppress the greatest documentary ever made about cigarettes, Thames Television's 1976 Death in the West, featuring five real cowboys dying from cigarettes. Still today, cannot that documentary still today cannot be legally broadcast in Britain, and there's a lifetime gag order on all participants. Try talking to Peter Taylor or the director or the editor of this uh, show, and you'll quickly find this out. As for power, keep in mind that tobacco has been the most successful industry, financially speaking, in the history of the world. A Credit Suisse study from 2015 showed that tobacco has produced an annual return of 19% since 1900, far outstripping all other industries. A dollar invested in 1900 would now be worth about $12 million. $1 has become $12 million, and that's the turquoise line at the top of this chart. Fisher is just a cog in this machine, of course, but his authority was such that for decades, even after his death, his genotype hypothesis figured big in litigation and in much of the industry's propaganda. It features prominently in the Tobacco Institute's uh, propaganda beginning in 1959, by which time the Institute is also making Fisher's book on this topic available free of charge to anyone who writes to the Institute. Fisher was held to have shown that the epidemiology of Hammond and Horn and Dahl and Hill was logically incompetent, with evidence again pointing instead to the genotype as having the crucial influence on whether one smokes and whether one gets cancer. Here it's perhaps worth pointing out that Fisher had a very narrow understanding of the kind of evidence arrayed against cigarettes. He never seems to have appreciated the importance of the animal experiments or the pathology. He rarely mentions the chemistry and he didn't understand the epidemiology. Cigarette makers even today like to uh, denigrate the epidemiology from that era as merely what they call statistical studies, which is rather like saying that archaeology involves nothing more than carbon dating, or that Newton's laws are just an exercise in calculus. Fisher himself, in February of 1960, lectured at the University of Wisconsin, complaining that we weren't paying enough attention to what he called the mess we're making of the atmosphere, and characterized as propaganda the claim that smoking had something to do with cancer. That same year, the Tobacco Institute reported on Fisher's work with identical twins, Claiming again, claiming again that the smoking patterns of identical twins were much more similar than those of non-identical twins. Reports such as these were assembled by the Tobacco Institute and sent to every physician and journalist throughout the country, acting along with reports that the effect of nicotine on the body was like exercise, or that lung cancer was rare in bald men, because we're really talking about hormones when we're talking about cancer vulnerability, or my all-time favorite uh, that, uh, citing a Dutch study claiming that lung cancer was ultimately traceable to the season into which you're born. So if you're born in March, that means your mother was pregnant during those cold winter months when fresh fruits and vegetables weren't available. So if you do get lung cancer, it's really your mother's fault. Uh, for having you uh, born in the spring. Now, Fisher also figured big in testi testimony before the United States Congress. In 1964, for example, a House Commerce Committee heard evidence from a Richmond statistician by the name of Alan Donahoe, claiming that Fisher, the greatest statistician of, this, of his generation, unquote, had found that smokers who inhaled had less lung cancer than those who inhaled. The causal link was doubtful, he claimed, because the evidence was full of contradictions and inconsistencies. One year later, a Chicago statistician and Royal Statistical Society fellow by the name of K. Alexander Brownlee 
cited three of Fisher's articles in support of his congressional testimony opposing placement of warning labels on cigarettes. Brownlee objected to the 1964 Surgeon General's report being taken as the final resolution of the cancer question and cited authority after authority disputing the cancer hazard without ever mentioning that all of these were in the pay of big tobacco as he was uh, himself. Brownlee cited Joseph Berkson's challenge to the causal view along with Fisher's demonstration that identical twins often have similar smoking habits. Brownlee even questioned the reality of the increase in lung cancer claiming this was likely just a diagnostic artifact from increased detection thanks to x-rays and bronchoscopy. The whole idea of cigarettes causing cancer, he testified, was ludicrous, nonsense, absurd, preposterous, and wildly speculative, all of which left us, as he says, in a sinking bog. Brownlee repeated many of these charges in 1969 in yet another appearance before Congress, here again opposing efforts to strengthen the warning on cigarettes. Brown. Lee uh, once again appealed to Fisher as, quote, the greatest statistician of his time and claimed no evidence of, of proof. So that's a pattern. Fisher's authority is used to defend tobacco with the industry recognizing this would be more credible than if R.J. Reynolds or Philip Morris itself made such a claim. This was the industry's so-called third-party strategy, whereby scientific or medical authority would be paid to deny the evidence followed by the industry, making sure such denials would make their way into the popular press. They planted stories in Barron's and in Esquire and in True Magazine, for example, even in the National Enquirer, which included a photograph, uh, this particular one, uh, of or uh, an image of uh, um, Sir Ronald. That article listed its uh, author, there's a little bit uh, bigger view of it, that article listed its author as a certain Charles Golden, which was entirely a fabrication. No such person even existed. And we know from the industry's documents that the article was actually written by the Tobacco Institute with the help of an industry front known as Tide Rock, which planted several such articles in the popular press. That was actually the first of the industry's dirty tricks to be exposed in the Wall Street Journal and uh, elsewhere. The denial campaign by this time was also incorporating humor. In 1967, for example, David Hardy from Shook Hardy and Bacon, the same firm that brought Fisher to the United States to help with litigation, uh, lectured to a national research conference citing Fisher, Brownlee, Burks, and Hans Eysenck, and a couple of dozen others in defense of this idea that lung cancer was best explained by a vulnerability Creating, created by one's constitutional makeup. The root cause was not the smoking, but the smoker. And Hardy chides his listeners that smoking has become, as he put it, the major cause of statistics, a joke that would be retold by the industry in countless other forums. Cigarette makers would continue to extol Fisher's itch in the lung hypothesis even into the 1970s and 80s, at which time it was also being called the genotype or genetic hypothesis, sometimes also the constitutional hypothesis or even the reverse hypothesis, as in cancer causes smoking. Philip Morris marketers in 1978, for example, endorsed the what they called the reverse hypothesis, i.e. that lung problems cause smoking. Philip Morris by this time was promoting numerous alternative causes for tumors, especially air pollution, viruses, and occupational exposures, and cigarette makers actually become the leading funder of viral research, which is one of the reasons Prusiner wins the Nobel Prize for his discovery of prions. All of Prusiner's work was funded by R.J. Reynolds as part of their small virus program because it blamed something other than cigarettes for the development of, of disease. All of these were part of the industry's holding strategy. They knew that the truth would eventually come out, but every year of obfuscation meant hundreds of millions in profits. This too is explicit in the industry's documents, notably the 1972 Panzer Memo, where the president of the Tobacco Institute, a former congressman from North Carolina, is informed that for 20 years, 
Arts, that is going back to the Plaza Hotel, the industry has been involved in what he calls a holding strategy, creating doubt about the health charge without actually denying it and emphasizing the right to smoke. And by this time, they're about to define uh, smoke as a form of uh, speech. So they're defending the right to smoke as a form of, of, of free speech. Cigarette makers write about this time a couple of years before had announced in one of their secret documents, doubt is our product, which becomes really the uh, enterprise uh, in a nutshell. So what did the tobacco industry actually know by this time? What is remarkable is that thanks to the discovery of a trove of the industry's own documents, through whistleblowers, leakers, and litigation, we have a good idea of what cigarette makers actually knew about their products, which is quite different from the story told by Fisher. And I should say that Fisher I believe to have been honest in expressing his views. I see him prof as profoundly naive, but I have no reason to suspect his honesty. Not so his handlers, however, who clearly knew they were not being honest with the outside world. Well, how do we know the industry was not being honest? We know this from numerous internal documents where the industry describes the Tobacco Industry Research Committee or Council for Tobacco Research as it's renamed as a front, a shield, a defensive operation. Reynolds even talks about the CTR as a way for the company to launder money for research. Philip Morris's research chief in 1970 writes internally, let's face it, we are interested in science, we are interested in evidence, which we believe denies the allegation that cigarette smoking causes disease. And what about during the time that Fisher was working for the industry? The crucial document here is the 1958 TRIP report chronicling the results of three leading, the three leading tobacco companies in Britain, Imperial, Batco, and Carreras, who sent their three top researchers on a month-long trip to the United States and Canada, again, 1958, to inquire into the state of the art with regard to whether cigarettes cause lung cancer. In April and May of that year, Herbert Bentley from Imperial, think John Player, Jeffrey Felton from British American, think State Express, and W.W. W. Reed from Carreras, think Craven A, interviewed dozens of researchers from every leading American cigarette maker and concluded that with one exception, Harry Green, who actually wasn't even working for the industry, it's a Yale pathologist, with one exception, the individuals whom we met with believed that smoking causes lung cancer. If by causation we mean any chain of events which leads finally to lung cancer and which involves smoking as an indispensable link. Again, this is their secret internal document. In the United States, only Berkson, Joseph Berkson at Mayo, they say, is now prepared to doubt the statistical evidence and his reasoning is nowhere thought to be sound. So what happens to Berkson? He's hired as a special projects operative and is used in much of the industry's third party strategy. This is an important document, this trip report, showing as it does that at the highest levels of the American cigarette establishment, a causal relationship was recognized between smoking and lung cancer as of 1958. It's also important because it rejects the argument being pushed by Fisher that some third unknown factor might be causing both smoking and lung cancer. Bentley, Felton, and Reed reported back to their superiors that there was no support for the view that in, in the same individual, the tendency to smoke and to be susceptible to lung cancer are each independently an outward expression of some third unknown factor. There are several other documents in the industry's secret files which show that the industry's claim of no proof was a deception. We now know about Reynolds' secret epidemiology from the 1940s, showing that smoking causes mouth cancer. We know about the American Tobacco Company financing a series of secret experiments at the Acousta Paper Company in 1952 and 53, showing that it was the tobacco and not the paper that made cigarettes so dangerous. We know that the largest tobacco companies for a time refused to put filters on the ends of their cigarettes, recognize these, recognizing these to be gimmicks and illusions with no real efficacy apart from creating a false reassurance. As for the question of inhalation, which vexed not just Fisher, but even Richard Dahl, 
We know that the industry knew that cigarettes were far more dangerous than cigars because of the sugar in the flu-cured leaf that allows the smoke to be drawn deep into the lungs while the low sugar tobaccos used in cigars allow smoke to be brought only into the mouth. Again, it's a question of how harsh uh, the resulting smoke is, which is why cigarettes damage the lungs while traditional cigars, generally speaking, do not. And it also has to do with the surface area exposed. The cancer goes where the smoke goes and cigarettes typically are inhaled, but traditional cigars or not, and this is the, the tennis ball, tennis court analogy. The surface area of the lungs is actually that of a, uh, a, a tennis court, which is a great opportunity for carcinogenesis, but the tobacco industry actually called that a great, great opportunity for dilution. Uh, yet another um, uh, uh, deception. These and many other findings were kept secret, leaving people like Fisher in the dark, albeit still capable of doing great damage. Recall that even though the scientific case was essentially closed by this time from those four converging lines of evidence that I mentioned, there was still, despite this, there were still plenty of hacks and flax and laggards willing to take money from the cartel. Useful savants, you could say, wittingly or unwittingly helping the industry throw sand in the gears of medical progress. That 1958 trip report, by the way, is significant in one other respect insofar as it reveals the collapse of what I call the single factor theory, the honest hope from this early 1950s period that there might be one or two bad elements in smoke that could be removed, rendering cigarettes entirely safe. That uh, theory is refuted in the trip report where we learned that Lorillard has found that cancer causing chemical, has found cancer causing chemicals in every fraction of smoke, rendering selective filtration impossible or as Philip Morris uh, puts it uh, internally, a thermodynamic impossibility. E. Keller Hammond at the American Cancer Society had held out the hope for, that the bad part of smoke could be identified and eliminated, rendering cigarettes entirely safe. But here in the trip report, it's recognized that there is not a clean part of smoke. It's all dirty. And taking the poison out of smoke would be like taking the H2O out of water, which is also why filters don't work which is also why Sir Charles Ellis was hired at British American Tobacco to radically redesign its, a, a cigarette. That was Batco's secret Battelle Hippo collaboration, codename Project Ariel, the goal of which was to make essentially a space age cigarette that would keep the addiction, lose the cancer, basically the philosophy behind uh, more recent electronic cigarettes. One last point about Fisher's collaboration, which included men like like Otmar Freiherr von Perschur, a notorious Nazi who actually was actually Joseph Mengele's thesis advisor. Oh, I don't want to say too much about this, but I will note the oddity of Fisher recruiting Perschur to work for the tobacco industry shortly after he himself began working as a recruiter for the industry. Uh, Fisher, I'm talking about. Fisher in 1956 had submitted a proposal to the Tobacco Manufacturer Standing Committee, basically the TIRC of Britain, for an inquiry into genotypes. And it was also around this time that he started helping Britain's cigarette makers find other scholars who could help exonerate cigarettes. Fisher renewed his correspondence with Per Schuer in Germany, asking if he would be willing to help determine the degree to which there is a, quote, objective evidence of a hereditary factor in smoking habits, as in the contrast between pipe smoking and cigarette smoke. Fisher wanted to know if Fairshuer could use his twin data to determine, quote, whether there is a re recognizable genetic component in the causation of this phenotypic distinction. He also mentioned that a fee would be available for Fairshuer's services. Think about what is going on here. Sir Ronald is acting as a recruiter for Big Tobacco, offering to pay Joseph Mingley's thesis advisor to assist with research that might help exonerate cigarettes from the charge of causing cancer. This after writing a letter of reference for, for, for sure, exonerating the man for wanting nothing more than to improve the German racial stock, including what he called the elimination of defectives, which Fisher may well not have known much about. Fisher had started recruiting for Big Tobacco in November of 1956, 
when he met with executives from British American Tobacco at the Blue Boar Hotel in Cambridge. Here's how Clement James, Esquire from the Tobacco Manufacturers Standing Committee, memorialized his meeting with Fisher and Trevor Russell Cobb. The most important outcome of our discussions, he writes, was that Sir Ronald agreed to look, among, look, a, look around among his younger colleagues for someone who would be prepared with a certain amount of guidance himself to write a highly technical paper subjecting the Dahl Hill survey to severe tests of statistical method. Sir Ronald thought that this would be a valuable exercise and seemed hopeful of being able to find a suitable writer. All of which was part of Fisher's efforts to help the TMSC exonerate cigarettes from the charge of causing cancer. Recall that the Fisher hypothesis basically held that there might be some confounding cause that, that led people both to smoke and to get cancer. Fisher's idea was that certain people are genetically predisposed to smoke while simultaneously being predisposed to get cancer, an idea actually ridiculed in the 1958 trip report, which is also where you, his, his eugenics came in. Cigarette makers loved eugenesis because they tended to blame nature rather than nurture for all manner of talents and maladies. If you get lung cancer or heart disease, you can blame that on your weak genes, your ancestry, which is also why the industry hired Clarence Cook Little as scientific director of the TIRC. Little had made a name for himself by inventing purebred strains of experimental mice, the so-called black six, but it also devoted himself to human eugenics. Prior to working for Big Tobacco, he'd served as president of the American Eugenics Society while also serving as president of two American universities. Little's name was removed from buildings on the campus of the University of, Mich of Michigan in 2018 and the University of Maine in 2021, though oddly, in, in my view, more for his eugenics than his tobacco connivance, which was actually far more deadly. From 1954 to 1969, Little had served as scientific director of the TIRC, the industry's chief distraction research engine, a body dismantled in 1999 as a result of the so-called Master Settlement Agreement and uh, when it was recognized widely as a fraud. Cigarette makers liked Little for the same reason they liked Fisher. He was, as he put it in a 1954 interview, ultra conservative about cause and effect relationships. Skepticism about cause and effect was a key part of the industry's denial campaign, which can be viewed as a war on causality. Helmut Wakeham at Philip Morris in 1959 had essentially redefined causality in biconditional form so that A causes B if and only if all A's lead to B's and all B's are preceded, preceded by A's. So alcohol doesn't cause traffic accidents because some people drink and don't crash, and some people who do crash weren't drinking, QED. This same ill logic was applied to tobacco. Some people smoke and don't get cancer, so we can't really say that cigarettes cause cancer. The name for that is sophistry. This helps us understand the paradox of cigarette makers being partly behind the rise of so-called evidence-based medicine, a monstrous uh, uh, linguistic expression, uh, in, in my view. You can think of cigarette makers as experts in evidentiary bar raising. They like to develop new and improved statistical techniques, which they would then use to claim that their opponents were not using these latest, most sophisticated techniques. That's why they funded Alvin Feinstein, head of Yale's program in clinical epidemiology, and one of the founders of evidence-based medicine. That's also why they paid Don Rubin at Harvard, who ended up becoming the highest paid industry witness, testifying in trial after trial that those blaming smoking for a particular, some particular disease uh, were, not, were, were using imperfect um, methods. But back to Fisher and his hypothesis, as one might expect, C.C. Little was a big fan of the Fisher hypothesis. He liked Fisher's idea that there might be a sex influence to lung cancer which fit with his own ideas that cancer was at root a genetic disease, which he interpreted to mean that it was caused by your ancestry, not environmental exposures. And the Fisher hypothesis remained important for cigarette 
industry lawyers who trained industry witnesses on the hypothesis at Shook Hardy headquarters in Kansas City. The hypothesis was also included in the curriculum of the College of Tobacco Knowledge, a global effort to keep tobacco industry spokespersons in alignment. It also featured in the tobacco industry's Truth Squad, which spent hundreds of hours every year on the air, on radio and television, disputing the evidence. So returning again to my original question of why cigarette makers funded eugenesis, they funded eugenesis and then geneticis, which is not always a perfect distinction, because eugenists were willing to place blame for health and disease on personal heredity, one's genetic constitution. The bottom line here is not complex. Cigarette makers gave people like Fisher a megaphone and used them like heat shields to take the blame off of cigarettes, blaming the victim. This was always a deception, at least on the industry's part. Cigarette makers knew the denial campaign was at root a holding strategy, consisting of raising doubts about the science while funding an alternative universe, a universe of science that was safe for the industry, mainly research into viruses, genetics, and other proximal mechanisms of disease. And it's actually one of the reasons that when Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971 and eventually shoveled billions into cancer research, cigarettes causing disease was essentially ignored. The industry had successfully turned cigarettes cause cancer from a medical fact into a political opinion. Even public health ag agencies were often led to, to treat the cigarette as an uncaused cause, an unmoved mover, with the industry itself never mentioned except to be thanked. And here you see this is a typical diagram here with the causation beginning with the cigarette, but the cigarette itself is uncaused, unmoved. Of course, that's the definition of nature uh, or of God in, in antiquity. That was the genius of this campaign, using support for science to distract from the truth, a new kind of sociology of science that made cigarette makers seem responsible while covering up their most damning secrets. That campaign starts at the Plaza Hotel in 1953. Expand, it expands into Canada in 1963 at the Royal Montreal Golf Club and into Britain and the continent in 1977 at Chuckerwick House with Operation Berkshire and into Japan in the mid-19, and Southeast Asia in the mid-1980s with the founding of the Tobacco Institute of Japan and the Smoking Research Foundation. The campaign was made possible by the, by the enormous financial power of the industry and the willingness of too many scholars to become cogs in that machine. We cannot say precisely how many people have been killed by this enterprise, the denial component, I mean, but we can say that if sales of cigarettes had continued on the downward path that began in 1952 and paralleled the path eventually taken when sales did finally fall in beginning in 1981, many millions of lives would have been saved, at least 8 million by uh, my calculation. Other polluters, of course, have learned to deploy many of these same diabolical tools of deception. Uh, compounding the, the original uh, uh, harm of, created by this particular industry. The lesson, I guess, is that lies can cost lives, especially when assisted by the most distinguished among us. Thank you.